the life of this church. Yesterday morning, I uh, received a call that our dear, dear friend, Gladys Lewendorf, who always speaks right over here, had woken up unresponsive, and uh, she's now in the comfort house. And uh, it's a little bit of a shock to me. You know, uh, there are people that are here every week, and then in God's divine plan, uh, one wakes up having something happen inside of her brain. And so now she's literally on the doorstep of heaven. And so pray for their family. And, uh, and there are people here that are ever so close to Gladys. And let's just uh, pause for a moment of prayer. Father, this is a family. And we love sharing life together as a family. And even though we know people like Gladys are so close to you and held firmly in the grip of your grace, thought of saying goodbye to them is difficult. So we just pray for grace. We pray for grace and um, in the life of Gladys' family, the life of close friends. We thank you for her place within this church. We love you, and we are so grateful once again this morning. We can celebrate that there is hope beyond the grave. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're in a series. We're almost done. Next week we're going to conclude our series uh, on the seven seals of Revelation. We've been going through this section uh, this year. We'll, we'll pick it up again next year for a few more as we systematically work our way through the book of Revelation over a course of a few years. But you know, as I begin this passage this morning, uh, we're a church, we have a mission, and our church is to fo- our mission is to follow Jesus and to build community and to unleash compassion. We know that when Jesus called his first disciples, he, he used this line, he says, he asked them to follow him. And then he would make them fishers of men. And so they dropped their nets and followed him. We know in the great commission that Jesus gave just prior to his ascension into heaven, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. So you see an ongoing theme here. This is something that should literally possess us as a church. This, this is our mission. Our mission is to go out and make disciples. And even as the Lord is commissioned in His role, that's, that's all about discipleship making as well. And this is something that the church must be very fervent in. And so, we as a church have been very bold to say that we want to be uh, missions oriented people that would literally send out missionaries from this place onto the mission field. Well, for all of us, we're missionaries. Some here, some here, and some that are going to go a long way away. So, I have a really simple commute home. I literally just go down Broadway here and then turn right at the university and go out to my neighborhood. But this week, as I was going down Broadway, there's a big sign there that says, Road closed. But I looked. It didn't look like it was closed, so I just drove through. Now I know in the next couple of days that sign, road closed, is literally going to mean road closed. And for the remaining summer, I don't think I'll be able to go down that street anymore. Dear people, there's going to come a day when the road is closed to heaven. No, it's going to come in the course of human history at one time, but it also comes in the course of our lives. When we haven't made a decision for Christ, in other words, we haven't repented and are turned from our sins and received the gracious gift of salvation, the road will be closed. It's not something we get to do after we die. So we need to take that seriously. And now, as we are living in this time of grace, not only people here this morning who may not have committed their lives to Christ that get to do that, but we also have the opportunity to go out and share that message with others about salvation. I believe in the course of what we've been reading in Revelation that there's a great revival coming. You know, throughout history, 
when you read about great revivals in church history, there have been times when there have been many, many who have come to know the Lord. Some of those that you, you're aware of. I mean, most of you know the ministry of Billy Graham. I remember back in the 40s. I wasn't there. But back in the 40s, when he decided he was going to lead what he called a crusade in Los Angeles, his first one, thought it may last a couple nights, ended up lasting far longer. And people came nightly and received Christ. We've seen movements like that in the history of the United States and also in the history of the world. Praise the Lord. And in spite of the sinfulness of humanity, the rebelliousness of humanity, that God still graciously extends His offer of salvation to people. You know, Peter wrote this in First, Second Peter three nine. He says, "The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand today, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish." but all to come to repentance. God truly does have a desire that people come to repentance. But we must remember He's holy and He's just. So He must deal with sin, but He truly desires people to come to repentance. The words of John 3.16 are true. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. Now, I've said it a variety of times. Brian has said it. Others have said it. But you know, when we wake up on a day like today, we have to know that there are over 3 billion people in the world who don't know anything of Jesus. They don't know anything of Jesus. And this, this 1040 window that goes across the map, okay, is an area where we need to send missionaries because they need to know Jesus. They need to know of salvation through Jesus Christ. And so, that's why Scott and Becky are going to go to Japan. It's in that window. That's why we pray that others would rise up within our church and say, I'll go. I'll be a missionary. That's why we need to invest ourselves in that, not think of our own selves and, and how we can spend money on ourselves all the time. And send missionaries to go to other places. You know, I've referred over the past few weeks to Jesus' discourse in Matthew 24, in the Mount of Olives. He was talking to His disciples. They were very inquisitive. Would you tell us about the end times? Would you tell us what's going to come to pass before you come back? And here's what He said in Matthew 24, 14. He says, The good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, what's interesting is the disciples heard this at this time in history. They didn't even know what the whole world looked like. They had no idea how big the world was. But Jesus gave this prophetic word at this time, that the word of God is going to go to all nations. All nations. The testimony of Jesus is going to go everywhere, and then he's going to return. So how is this going to happen? Well, I believe we're going to see it in this passage that we're going to read from Revelation 7, verses 9 to the end of the chapter. But now listen to this. Last week, I introduced this chapter as an interlude. As an interlude. We came out of chapter 6, unbelievably bombastic with the great day of the Lord, judgment pouring forth on earth, and now John gets this interlude. It's like a breather after witnessing all these cataclysmic things to come in the future. Now, the first half of the chapter, which we did last week, is about the 144,000 144, people from Israel being sealed to do a work. And now we continue into this section, which begins with the word, after this. So this is another vision. After this. What God's word says. After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands. Okay, we'll stop there. We'll talk about this for a moment. What a strange 
what a scene. Remember the specificity of the amount last week, 144,000? Now we have this vast number that no one could number. What have been going on? Well, what we see is going to happen in the future is this. God is going to extend His grace during some of the most difficult times in history. He is a gracious God. There is all sorts of things that will be going on at this time. During this time called the Great Tribulation, Satan will be furious, and there will be all sorts of fury being poured out by him and his demons as they seek to ravage the world. Because remember, Satan comes to lie, steal, and destroy. I hope you know that. I hope you can see that. And it's only going to get worse. And there will be times, there will be a time when the Antichrist, all a part of Satan's minions, and that he will be dealing in great terror. And then we also know of the great day of the Lord. God will also be bringing judgment to this world. And what will happen during this time? Well, let's go back to the book of Zechariah, because Zechariah points to this time. Yes, Zechariah from the Old Testament. Zechariah 12, 10 says this. Listen. Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David and the residents of Jerusalem, and they will look at me whom they fear. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. Zechariah is already prophesying towards the end and saying there's going to come a day that the people from the house of David, that's Israel, are going to mourn for Jesus. They're going to cry out for Jesus. They're going to want Jesus. That day is going to come. Praise the Lord. Well, we also get an indication of this in Romans 11, of which we just studied a summer ago. Romans 11, verses 25 to 27. Very important. Paul says this, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you will not be conceited. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Did you hear that? A partial hardening has come on Israel. That's not a surprise to us. If we go to Israel right now, we'll find out that one quarter of one percent are Christians. That reflects a hardening. That hardening is right there. There are Christians in Israel. There are Jewish people who have come to know Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. We know some of them. That's where we, uh, uh, who we use for our tours over there. And Paul continues with this. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sin. Paul is prophesying that there will come a day that Israel does come to know Jesus. Will every single one of them come to know Jesus? No. But there will be an unbelievable revival in that land like never seen before, of which Jewish people will come to embrace Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Now, when that happens, when that happens, and it will be an unbelievable day, the first fruits of those who have come to know Jesus will be that 144,000 that we talked about last week. They will be evangelists. These 144,000 last week, we talked how they were sealed to do the work of the Lord. What's the work of the Lord? The same work that First Church is called to do, to follow Jesus. The same work that Jesus said in His Great Commission, to go and make disciples. That's the work of the Lord. And these 144,000 from Israel will be released on the world, and we will see the greatest revival, perhaps, that we've ever seen. And folks, we have to go back to the Old Testament. So we went back to Zechariah. Now if we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter 12, when God was making a covenant with Abraham. And God was making a covenant with Abraham, and he said this, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your land, your relatives and your father's house, to be in the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. What kind of nation? 
great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on the earth. How many peoples? All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Folks, this is a missions prophecy for the future of which we are going to see happening during this time in Revelation. So we could connect some sort of a string from Revelation 12 and we could connect it to Matthew 28 where Jesus gives the Great Commission when he talks about all nations. We can then take the string and we can bring it all the way here to Revelation chapter 7. It all connects together. There's going to be great revival. Well, as John is seeing this vision as to what's going to happen in the future, who are the people in this passage? See, up until this time, John, John has seen a lot with his vision. Think about this. He's dictated these letters by Jesus, those first seven letters, and in those letters, He's told about how some of these early young churches are experiencing bad things already, that they need to come to repentance. If they don't come to repentance, if they don't get things right, the Lord is going to take their lampstand away and they're not going to be a church anymore. We see that happen throughout history. Churches that have lost their lampstands because they've lost the Bible, they've gone on their own way, and they're not even proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ anymore. John has seen pictures of judgments being poured out. How difficult that must have been for him to see. And now, in this interlude in chapter 7, he gets to see all these people who've been saved. What a great scene. The group is different than the 144,000 that he saw in, in the previous part of this passage. There's no number mentioned. It's a vast multitude. It's a vast multitude from every tribe, nation, and people and language which no one can number. See the specificity of 144,000 and see the lack of specificity with no one can number. See how God's grace is poured out there. And then they're wearing white robes. Well, we know that there were saints, saints that were praying under the altar a few weeks ago in the fifth seal because they were martyred. And dear people, probably what will happen in this revival probably what will happen in this great revival as people are coming to know the Lord because of the unbelievable persecution that's going on against Christians. Many, if not most of them, will be killed. They'll be martyred. You want to follow Jesus? Are you willing to give your life? Are you willing, really to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Him? We know that right now in the world, when people make a commitment to follow Jesus, it can be a death sentence for them of their earthly life. At this time, there will be many, many people who will be martyred for the cause of Christ. Hmm. They're also carrying palm branches. Now, when we think of palm branches, we think of what? Palm Sunday, right? Palm Sunday, yep. Yeah. And they're waving branches on Palm Sunday in Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna! It's a time of celebration. That's what palm branches were used for. It's for celebration, it's for joy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These people who are waving these palm branches have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And what's happening is they've been redeemed. They've been taken out of this sin-soaked world that's being ravaged by Satan. Satan is, is just going at it with full blasters. They've been taken out of this world. And where have they been brought? To heaven. To the land of the redeemed. Oh, how happy they were. What else would they do than wave these palm branches celebrating their place with the Lord? And folks, that's exactly what we're a part of today. When we tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ, that they can have an eternity of complete and utter peace and a complete and utter grace and mercy and fulfillment in ways that we could never imagine for heaven pulled out of the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of our Savior and Lord. And where are they? They're standing before the throne of God. They were right in the center of things before the throne of God. What an awesome scene that John gets to see. Now look at verse 10. And they cried out in what kind of a voice? 
A loud voice, a loud voice. My mother always said I had that down. Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, folks, I can't help but stop here because this is very biblical. Worship is loud. Christians are not to be tight lipped singers. Hey, my dad, he had the most out of tune voice on the planet Earth. I mean, it was terrible. But as a little boy growing up, my dad, who actually grew up in a Lutheran church, someone taught him along the line, open up your mouth and sing. And he did. It was terrible. But, but he sang. And he taught this little boy to sing loud. And so I always sang loud, and I praise the Lord that I was blessed with the ability to keep the tune that my dad wasn't. But folks, we are meant to sing, to sing, and cry out with a loud voice. That's why a church should be known for its singing. Have a praise team up here. They sing loud. That's great. But unless you sing loud, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. We worship with loud voices. It's very biblical. God deserves loud praise. It will be seen in heaven. Look what it says in Psalm 66. Let the whole earth shout joyfully to God. Shout joyfully. This is the one place where we can tell kids, use your outside voices. Right? Use your outside voices. Praise the Lord loudly. Psalm 101. Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to the Lord. This is a picture of heaven. That's why when we say we need to let it go, we'll get a chance to do that in two moments. Revelation 7, verses 11 to 12. All the angels stood around the throne, and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. We call that a doxology. Many of them throughout the book of Revelation. Look who's there. Angels are around the throne. Elders in this passage often interpreted as the church being around the throne. The living creatures we described a few weeks ago as the cherubim, the exalted order of angels. All present fall on their faces before the throne and they worship God. What a sight. Worship is the constant occupation of the Christian. It's the constant occupation. It doesn't just take place here in this room, but when we go out from here, we continue in our worship. We continue to acknowledge to everything we do during the week, whether we're eating, whether we're drinking, whether we're playing, whether we're at work, whatever we're doing. It's an act of worship to the Lord. And what we do is we fall down in submission to Him because He is the King of our lives. Let's go to verse 13. Where did they come from? Listen. Then one of the elders asked me, who are these people in white robes, and where do they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. Then he told me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What an interesting scene here. One of the elders asks, John, who are they? Where have they come from? What's going on here? The elder didn't ask because he didn't know, but, but to underscore the point for John and the people who would ultimately read this, including us, they are ones coming out of the Great Tribulation. Who is this vast multitude of people? They're ones coming out of the Great Tribulation. This Great Tribulation that's going on right now. Remember those 144,000 evangelists who just went out and they were sealed to do the work of the Lord? This is the result of what God has done through them. These are the ones coming out of the Great Tribulation. These people here that you see, these people here in the white robes, they have lived in that time of tribulation. And they have been redeemed during that time of tribulation. And now, whatever it was, sometimes they have come here by way of violence. Sometimes they have come here by way of martyrdom. Sometimes some of them may have come by natural causes. But they are now here, redeemed from the Great Tribulation. Wow. 
and their robes have been washed because of the blood of Jesus. That's the only way to salvation. Verse 15, what are they doing? What are they doing? And what is God doing? Listen. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve Him day and night in His temple. The one seated on the throne will shelter them. They could stand for the Lord because they were with Jesus. They were in that location because they were redeemed. And what do they do? They serve. We talk about worship being this occupation of the Christian. Service is the occupation of the Christian. Now, some of you may have jobs. Some of you are farmers. Some of you work in a factory. Some of you sell things. We all have our things that we list as our occupation. But folks, for the Christian, our occupation is worship and service. That's what we do. Worship and service. We just happen to be disguised as plumbers, carpenters, and factory workers and farmers. To go into the world and to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. This is what this picture in heaven is all about. And what does it say that God does? He shelters and protects. Some of your translations may say this. He spreads his tabernacle over them. Again, what a scene. You know, in earth, there are people that experience a tremendous amount of suffering. Sometimes that suffering could be being ravaged by a disease. Sometimes the suffering could be being in a war-torn land. Sometimes the suffering could be great persecution of some sort. But you can imagine these people coming out of the Great Tribulation seeing the worst of the worst in so many ways, and they come into heaven, and God is so great over him. His tabernacle, his presence, his protection. I don't know if as a little kid you were ever lost anywhere. I can remember being lost one time in the grocery store. How do you get lost in a grocery store? But I lost my mom. And I go through each aisle and I'm looking for my mom. I'm looking for my mom. I'm about four years old. I can't find my mom. Surely she wouldn't have left the store without me. And then finally I see her and I run to her and I remember crying and she hugged me. She says, what's the matter? I didn't know where you went. And you know what she did to me? She just hugged me. She just took me in her arms. She says, it's okay. I don't ever leave without you. Well, of course that's what a mother or a father would do to their child. And this is what God does to us when we come out of the sin so world into heaven. And he wraps his presence around us, and whatever that looks like, it says he spreads his tabernacle over us, and he embraces us. You're okay now. You're safe. Forever and ever. Praise the Lord. The verses 16 and 17, they will no longer hunger, they will no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat. For the Lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to streams of the waters of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. These people who are in this beautiful scene probably experience hunger, probably experience thirst, probably due to all the cataclysmic natural things that were going on, experienced scorching heat. And now they were in the place of eternal satisfaction. Let's go back to Isaiah 49 because Isaiah talks about this. In Isaiah 49 verse 10, he says this, They will not hunger or thirst. The scorching heat or sun will not strike them. For their compassionate one will guide them and lead them to spring. When you read that in Isaiah, folks, you can't help but think, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. You know, people are worried about climate change. People are worried about global warming. They should be. But it's a global warming that's coming at God's intention as God's intention, and we need to seek the eternal 
springs that only come through Jesus Christ. It is going to get bad here. It's going to get worse here. But it's going to be great there. There's an overwhelming nature of this beautiful scene. And let's live today with this scene in mind that one day we too will be captured up to that throne room of the Lord where there is no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering. That should put us in the very long place today. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this interlude in Revelation. Thank you for giving John the picture of what is to come. That so many will be saved at a time of great peril on this earth. And Lord, for us now, I pray that we would take seriously to go into this world, to go into Pellet, to go into this region, and to go to the uttermost parts of the earth with the words of Jesus, the salvation of Jesus, so that together one day we will be gathered with people from all nations, all tribes, all languages, praising the Lamb. Singing in full power God. Thank you for the place you've given to us as the church to proclaim the truth. 